All right, looks like we are live for our three o'clock live stream from Fort Humboldt State Historic Park. Talking about Humboldt history. Today we're gonna to be talking about some more of the people who resided here at the fort or helped to get it established. So just wait a couple minutes to see if we can't have some people joining. And as you are joining, just let me know if you can hear me, if you can see me, if the screen's right side up or if it's upside down, if it's a nice looking day or it's a not nice looking day. All right, looks like we have some people joining. Thanks so much. Just adjust this a little bit, sorry. There we go. Let's give a couple more minutes or seconds, see if anybody else joins here. Thank you so much for joining our three o'clock live stream on Humboldt history. Again, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about some of the people who helped to establish Fort Humboldt, uh, start bringing people over to this area. All right, it's looks like we got four people joining now. Um, if you are joining, let me know if you can hear me, if you can see me. Let's give a couple more seconds. beautiful day out here today. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Kyle. I'm a park interpretive specialist for California State Parks. I work out of Fort Humboldt State Historic Park uh, here in Eureka. Um, thanks so much for joining our three o'clock live stream here today. Some of you may be wondering why am I out in the park when um, some of you are at home. Um, just want to say thank you all so much for doing your part to help flatten the curve of COVID-19 by staying home, practicing social distancing. We're doing these three o'clock live streams every day of the week to help give you guys a little bit of the parks that you're missing and maybe some um, outdoor scenery that you might be missing as well. And hopefully to give you something, um, hopefully to give you something to look forward to when you are able to return out to our parks, and maybe see some places that you haven't seen before. So thank you guys all so much for joining our live stream. Uh, Norma, it is a little chilly out here today. We've got nice clouds, uh, a little overcast today. Beautiful. Hi, Mom. People tuning in from Tokyo and Japan. Wow, spectacular. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so for those of you who are a little further away, you might be wondering uh, where I'm at in California. Thank you, Sandra, for the feedback. I'm glad that it's looking good. Um, I'm on the northern coast of California, right along the water by Humboldt Bay. And this is right in the middle of... Um, this is right in the middle of Eureka, a city on the northern coast of California. Um, there is a Fort Humboldt, and this place is not necessarily associated with any military conquest or anything like that up here on the north coast. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of military action going on up here or wars or anything like that. This place was actually established to mitigate conflict between the indigenous people in this area and settlers coming in um, mining for gold and timber obviously huge up here in the redwoods, people looking for timber. Uh-oh, it froze. Hopefully you guys can still hear me, still see me. Give me one second, just make sure that... Okay. All right, so let's go ahead. Um, today I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about some of the people who lived at Fort Humboldt or helped get it established. Um, and I do want to recognize really quick that we are on ancestral Wiat land here in um, at Fort Humboldt and Humboldt Bay is ancestral Wiat land. And I am going to be talking about the indigenous groups in this area. And I'll be using terms like first people of the area, indigenous people, native people. But I just want to recognize that there's no perfect term to refer to a collective group of tribes. Um, the Wiat tribe is the ancestral land that we're on today. But there were a number of tribes that were affected by the events that took place here at Fort Humboldt. So again, today we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of the people here at Fort Humboldt. If you want to know more about the history, you can check out our past live streams on our YouTube page or our Facebook page uh, to get a little bit more information, background, all that good kind of stuff. And during our normal operations, you can come by Fort Humboldt at 11 o'clock any Saturday for a tour from a live person uh, during our normal operations. So the first person I'd like to talk about today um, is Josiah Gregg and the Gregg Party. And these were a number of individuals who were part of the first overland party to Humboldt Bay. And now it is important to recognize that there were people living on Humboldt Bay before the Gregg party came out here. Um, the Wiat people 
lived all around Humboldt Bay, um, and it, this was essentially where they got everything they needed, kind of a Costco or a Walmart of that time. But unlike our Costco or Walmart, this area was sacred to them and everything in it. So thousands of years ago, we got people lived here. And if you can believe it, there was no mall right here in front of me. There was no freeway right below me. You can see that right there. Um, and instead, this pristine saltwater marshes, this bay, would come all the way up to the base of this bluff here. And then behind me, instead of neighborhoods and things like that, you can see a line of trees, but you'd have a dense redwood forest coming all the way up to the end of this bluff. And then to the south of here, there was a Wiat village called Kutswalik, uh, where the land connected back to the rest. So this bluff was up here, naturally barren of trees, and this first overland party came from the Trinity Mine, inland of where I'm standing today. And it's about 100 miles inland of where we stand now. So gold mining is what really got people kind of exploring up here on the north coast and uh, looking for some places to establish. People were coming up to the Trinity Mine looking for gold. It wasn't the biggest or most successful gold mine, but it brought a lot of people to the area. And it was a relatively isolated gold mine. So people were coming up to get this gold. They were fairly successful. And then they would have to go all the way back down to Sacramento or San Francisco in order to actually profit off of the gold that they've extracted from here. And that was a long journey as well. They would use things like pack mules to make these big trains go all the way down to Sacramento and San Francisco where they could sell the gold and actually buy some things with their with their hard work. So it became desirable that they wanted to find some place that they could ship the gold south by the ocean rather than having to go by land. So they got together this very first party to come and find this kind of elusive bay um, that had been spoken of in a couple of journals. And so they knew that something was nearby and they were told by the native people living here that there, there was a bay, and it was about an eight-day journey to get there. So Josiah Gregg put, up this, put together this party, and a few individuals um, worth noting here is L.K. Wood. L.K. Wood was one member on the party, uh, James Van Dusen, David Buck, and Josiah Gregg. Um, there were four other individuals, party of eight, but... Those four names kind of ring out through Humboldt. Um, there's a number of things named after these people who are a part of this party. So they were told that their journey would take about eight days, about 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 two weeks, or about uh, eight to ten days for their journey, about a hundred miles from the Trinity Mine all the way to what is now called Humboldt Bay. So they began their journey. They provisioned for their eight to ten days, um, and they were told by the native people to follow an inland route that is now the Highway 299. But they didn't exactly trust that, that suggestion, so instead they followed the Trinity River for a long while. And they were told by the native people that the Trinity River becomes impassable and they would not be able to go all the way to the ocean following the river. So they did get to a point where they were, they were, unable, um, they were unable to continue following the Trinity River and then they headed west um, over land to try and find the bay. And this journey was incredibly difficult. These redwood forests at the time um, had not been accessed by people trying to cross through them. Um, native people were using them at the time for hunting and gathering deer, and elk, berries, nuts. And they were comfortable moving through these woods, but the people the, at this mine had not had a lot of experience uh, crossing through these redwoods. So this, this party with, David, um, with Josiah Gregg leading it was said that they averaged less than two miles a day when they were going through Redwood Forest. And every time that they did make it through a Redwood Forest, they found a snow-capped mountain on the other side. So they had to cross that, and on the other side of the mountain, there'd be another dense Redwood Forest. Uh, one member of their party, L.K. Wood, was mauled by two grizzly bears at once while they were crossing through these Redwoods. It said that it dislocated his hip, and he was unable to travel without the aid of a horse. These are incredibly difficult um, traveling for these people. And they set out in November. They thought it was going to take them around 8 to 10 days. And they didn't arrive up to Humboldt Bay until January. It took them months to make this journey. They ran out of food fairly quickly and they had to hunt to kind of feed themselves and um, access food from tribes along the way. 
kind of helped them out and fed them. So with the help of other people, they did finally make it out here. And they were actually north of the bay where I stand today. And they had to work their way back down along the coast. They were even north of Trinidad, um, pretty far north of here. It was a pretty treacherous journey. But they did finally make it. They were starving. They were exhausted. They had run out of food. And thankfully, there was that village right on the bay here called Kutswalik. This was a Wiat village right on the bay. And they saw the Greg party across the water, and they went to help them. They brought them over on these redwood canoes and kind of nursed them back to health. They fed them. They let them rest. It is a little windy on the edge here. Let me know if it does get too windy too um, here. But I do want to highlight the chief of this village here at the time, Kiwilata. So he was the chief of the village when the Josiah Gregg party came by and him and the people living there kind of helped nurse them back to health. They had a relatively peaceful first meeting. But attitude at the time, there had been 200 years of fighting with indigenous people across the entire United States. So many of the settlers, um, Josiah Gregg's party included, kind of had a prejudice against these indigenous people. And as they were leaving, one of the members, David Buck, carved into a nearby tree, Buck's Port, to claim this area as his own. This was a common practice during that time to kind of carve into a tree um, to claim a territory or stake a claim on an area. And the McDonald's right about there is where this, uh, where this village Kutswalik was originally. So David Buck's party, or not David Buck, excuse me, Josiah Gregg's party, a nurse back to health kind of went on their way, but they didn't get along that well. Even throughout their journeys, they had been fighting. Um, Josiah Gregg was a scientific man, and he took measurements all the way, made notes, but he was also their navigator. So scientific measurements were important for them to navigate at that time. They didn't have GPS or really a map of this area. So he was going off of um, constellations and making sure that they were continuing west even when they got lost and turned around in the forest. The rest of the party didn't necessarily understand so much what he was doing for navigation, so they got really tired of him stopping, making all these notes, um, pulling out instruments. They actually got in a bad enough fight crossing one river that they left Josiah Gregg on one side, and when he caught up to them he was absolutely furious. And after that fight they named the river the Mad River. It's still called the Mad River today. When they did finally arrive on the bay, they named it Trinity Bay. And when they went back to discuss their, or tell everyone else their findings and bring more people up to this area, they split up into two parties to go back because they were so fed up with each other. One party followed the coast back down and another went inland. It was said that uh, the party that Josiah Gregg went with kind of fared worse. They were the ones following the coast. Um, and Josiah Gregg actually did not make it back from this journey. He um, said they, they had run out of food, that he was starving. He fell from his horse and they were unable to get him back up. There are some versions of this story, however, that suspect foul play here, that pe they were so fed up with, um, with Greg that once he fell from his horse, there wasn't a whole lot of effort to revive him or bring him along. That they kind of just left him where he was. So when they went back and reported their findings, it really brought a lot of people to this area. Bucksport was established as a town just south of here. And for a while, Bucksport was a diverse town where the village of Gutswalik once was. Um, indigenous people worked there and a number of immigrants coming into the area um, kind of all lived there in harmony for a short time. But a number of laws passed by the government um, kind of excluded some of those groups and asked for their removal. So they were, so it wasn't, it wasn't such a diverse area always. One more person I would like to talk about before we wrap up for today. Um, it was much later at the fort. This was after its establishment, after most of the buildings were built. Um, the soldiers were so terribly bored up here that they resorted to drinking and kind of got into trouble um, because they were so bored they didn't have a whole lot to do. Again, this place wasn't um, anywhere for military conquest. It was their job to mitigate conflict between these indigenous communities and the settlers coming in for gold mining and timber. So the soldiers um, didn't do a whole lot most of the time. They felt there wasn't a lot they could do to intervene with the conflict, um, so they spent a lot of time building up the fort. And after they did that, there was drilling and just practicing, cleaning their weapons and uniforms, and it was all fairly boring to them. So they brought in this kind of um, American frontier figure named Seth Kinman. 
And you may have heard of Seth Kinman. He made um, these kind of incredible skin um, and bone chairs. So he would go hunting. He would use the skins, antlers, and things that he collected, essentially his trophies, to construct these chairs. And a pretty famous one that he gave to President Lincoln um, after creating it. So you may have heard Seth Kinman's name before for these kind of um, elaborate chairs that he would make. So they brought him up to Fort Humboldt to help the um, enlisted men. It says, in the early days of Fort Humboldt, enlisted men slept side by side in tents with little more than a full blanket between themselves and on the ground. Here's, here's what we got on, on Seth Kinman. Life was not always dreary. Local mountain man and hunter, Seth Kinman entertained the soldiers with tall tales of his trailblazing and exploits with grizzlies. He played music on a fiddle made from the skull of his favorite mule, Dave, and traveled to Washington, D.C present elaborate elkhorn chairs to four presidents, including Abraham Lincoln. There's a pres there's a picture of Seth Kinman right there. So he's kind of this famous um, American frontier figure, and he would show off his skins and things like that. Yeah, that wind is blowing. Please excuse me if, uh, if I'm getting a little hard to hear. I'll try and cover the microphone as much as I can. Um, so Seth Kinman, Seth Kinman was living here at the fort, and he would go out and hunt for the men. It was said that he would bring back um, up to two elk a day. He was kind of an avid hunter and would, would bring a lot of meat back for them. Um, I, and he, he was an avid hunter and unfortunately with all of this legacy and um, spectacular tales of him, it gets overlooked some of the bad things he did as well. And among his trophies, unfortunately, were Native American scalps. So in addition to hunting animals, he also hunted people. So he wasn't always a spectacular guy. I just want to recognize how important it is to tell all parts of a story. So Seth Kinman is kind of this, this iconic character, making these chairs, being a big hunter and things like that, that it often gets overlooked that um, he was a person with flaws, that he was living in a time when there was so much prejudice against the native people and laws that encouraged hunting them. And he he was involved in all of that. So, while an interesting character had a had a bad side to him as well, just like so many people do. All right, and with that, I'm going to wrap up for today. But I want to thank you guys all so much for joining me here at Fort Humboldt State Historic Park, learning a little bit more about some of the people who lived here. And I just want to remind you that we are doing these live streams every single day at 3 o'clock off of our Facebook page, and that all of them are backed up on our YouTube page. So if you want to go back and watch some of the past live streams you may have missed, um, they're all up there on our, our, our YouTube page, or you can go back on our Facebook page to find them as well. Um, Sarah, I see you've never heard of Sith Kinman. Um, it seems that now he's not as popular of a character to talk about, um, but I've actually had a number of people come to Fort Humboldt looking for information on Seth Kinman and his time here. Um, and he did live here again with the soldiers kind of to help help entertain them through some of their boredom. So again, thank you guys all so much for joining us. Um, there will be another live stream going on tomorrow at 3 o'clock with Griff out of Humboldt Redwoods. Um, thank you guys all so much for tuning in. Um, hopefully you're staying safe out there, sanitizing, practicing social distancing, um, and hopefully getting a little preview of the parks. Um, creates a little break in your day. So thank you again all so much for joining. Tune in tomorrow for another another program. And if you have any questions, I'll be hanging out in the comments for another couple of minutes. Um, but thank you guys all so much for tuning in and listening. I really appreciate it. A big white building right in front of me. Sandra, I see your question. This is the hospital building. There's also this other building over here. This is a living quarter. These are the surgeons' living quarters. So the hospital building here on the left, maybe you're right. I'm not sure how inverted this is. Um, this was, this is said to be the only building still standing at Fort Humboldt. There was a preservation effort um, after this property was sold to a land developer, so that he maintained this building so it could still be standing once it was purchased by the once this property was purchased or. Once this property was donated to the state parks, this building was still standing. It's said to be the only building still standing at Fort Humboldt. 
This one on the right is a reconstructed surgeon's quarters using letters written by one of the people who lived here. Harriet Simpson wrote elaborate letters with her boredom, and so this, this house was kind of reconstructed um, in her memory using those letters. Great question, Sandra. If you wanna be able to check out the inside of those buildings, um, check out some of my past live streams. I walked through both of them. Um, the very last one, I talked a lot about Harriet Simpson and her time here. She's the one who lived in that surgeon's house. Uh, the last live stream that I did, we really went through that house and talked about um, Harriet Simpson's experience with living here, as well as her um, servant slash maid, Bridget, from Ireland. Thank you, Cammie, for the shout out. Tours at Fort Humboldt every Saturday at 11 during our normal operation. And great question, Sandra, thank you. All right, everyone, I'm gonna sign off again. Every day at three o'clock, we've got these live streams. Tune in, check them out. Thank you guys all so much for joining. Yes, this is the only account doing the daily live streams at three o'clock, Sarah, thank you for asking. But if you do want to check out um, the main California State Parks Ports program has um, K through 12 education going on all day. Well, not all day, um, till, till about three o'clock every day. So you can register for those at ports-ca.us. Uh, you can also find that on the California State Parks Ports page. Um, more information about those programs. It's K through 12 education going on from, I believe, eight o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the afternoon. And check out the ports page for more information. Yes, Sandra, that is the house with the very neat desk. Of course, Sarah, thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Daily live streams here at three o'clock. Um, more things going online from the California State Parks ports page. We also have a number of videos available on our YouTube page. Hang in there, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in and hopefully we'll see you out in the parks very soon.